annual DEF CON convention. This meeting was held in exciting Las Vegas, Nevada from July 9th through the 11th, 1999. This is video tape number 19, Insecurities in Networking Devices. Yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> I'll make them available on the DEF CON site afterwards and, and then you'll be having there. Um, my name is Rooster and I am a network engineer. I design and implement large scale networks, routers, switches, ATM, FIDI, whatever you want to call it. Um, deal with all different aspects of networking issues. So what, we, what we're talking about here today is insecurities in <clears throat> networking devices. Um, but the question is, how did we come across the problem? The problem is, back in the old days, like way back in the Stone Age, when they were chopping wheels out of rock, they used to manage things through the console port, which was really cool when you only had like three routers to play with. No big deal. But then as time progressed and man became more advanced, they discovered other countries and they discovered need for offices in other countries. So they had to decide how they were going to actually manage these routers in other countries, you know. So say you set up an office with like five people. You put a, you know, a network, your network connectivity there, but you don't have enough people there to make it worth getting a network administrator for every site. How do you take care of it? Hence the need for remote administration. The problem with remote administration, remote management, is that any time you leave a path for yourself to get into a device, you basically leave a path for somebody else as well. And the less you know about that path that you've opened, the more the other person is going to know how to get into it. One of the biggest problems with remote management is the lack of understanding of, by the administrator what he's got. <clears throat> In fact, most networking devices actually come stock, I mean, come regularly set up with um, remote management turned on. You plug it in, you turn it on, it's there. People don't even realize this. In fact, with really basic configurations. Um, since there's no authentication for these, for a lot of these, it's pretty easy to get through. So the things that we're talking about today, we're talking about routers, we're talking about Ethernet switches, we're talking about ATM switches, FIDI, basic network infrastructure, the stuff that, that you start with when you design your infrastructure. So just to make sure everybody's, you know, we're all on one page, we'll talk a little bit about what the difference between a router and a switch is. So we're talking about the different devices, we don't know what we're talking about. The problem with router and switch is marketing has come through and they've totally redefined the way that people use these terms. They've got, you know, layer three switches and layer four switches and just a bunch of marketing mumbo jumbo. It means nothing. I mean, if you really want to come down to it, most likely you're talking about, if you're talking layer three, you're talking a router, and if you're talking layer two, you're talking a switch. <clears throat> layer three, as a general rule, your router is what's going to go between two different networks. Uh, layer two, you're going to segment the same network. Hope that makes sense, y'all. Y'all look kind of bright, so I figure it's probably a waste of time telling you this stuff. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> the methods that people use to manage these tools, the, the, uh, out of the management for, for networking devices, is the basic protocol for this is called SNMP. I'm sure everybody says. By the way, if anybody has any questions, like, like if I go too fast by something, please feel free to, to stop me, and then we'll have a questions at the end. Um, so SNMP stands for Simple Network Management Protocol. This provides that management capability remotely. It's, an, it's actually an amazing protocol. It's really, really simple, and it can do a lot of amazing things. The problem is that it does a lot of amazing things very insecurely. Um, <laughs> as many people know, um, you can do just about anything depending on the manufacturer of the device with it. For instance, Cisco has, man has got a kind of a half-assed implementation of uh, SNMP, so you can only do so much. I mean, you could do anything, but unlike, let's say, something like Bay, where it's just like everything is completely open to SNMP. Um, it's UDP, so anything that's UDP based is going to be insecure. Um, UDP is your, you know, as you know, is they said, well, let's make the most basic protocol that we can, and we'll let the application worry about things like security and checksums and, you know, fragmentation and things like that. So UDP does nothing of that. Um, it goes across it, everything on the SNMP goes across in clear text. 
There's no encryption, nothing. No authentication, there's nothing involved at all. So you put a sniffer on the wire, you're seeing exactly what the, how the management system's working. And as such, it's completely insecure. It's probably one of the weakest protocols that we have on the internet that, as important as it is, has become. The way SNMP works, it has a really, really basic, kind of primitive method of authentication, passwords. But they're not really called passwords, they're called community strings. And what community strings are is a basically a password that, you, that each device allows access to a different part of it. Community strings usually come in two variances. There's actually three, but the two important ones are read-only and read-write. Read-only allows you access to, basically, you can look at the entire, anything that's on the router. It, likes to, it says read-only. Uh, Read-write actually allows you to set, to make changes on the switch or the router. Well, and I want to briefly address SNMP on your hosts, Unix boxes, you know, things like that. There's actually not a lot you can do. Um, the, the manufacturers of you know, HP and all these people haven't really put a lot of functionality for SNMP in, in, their, um, in their hosts. There are a few exceptions, and there are, it's good to know that there are some, definitely some bugs with SNMP in hosts. I mean, the obvious ones are going to be buffer overflows for root. I mean, those, there, I saw five of them just the other day. Um, in fact, there was one that Sun had that a good friend of mine, Jerem, the Alhambra, came up with, where Sun had a SNMP community string hard coded into their SNMP daemon, or not, yeah, daemon, so that it didn't matter what you set it at, it was always, this one would always work. Nice little backdoor that they provided for everybody. Something to always watch out for. You know, actually, as a side note, backdoors are something always to watch out for. Does anybody here use 3Com? Nobody uses 3Com routers? You realize that with a 3Com router or hub, that if you have a MAC address and you're on another 3Com hub, you can automatically gain full access to any other 3Com hub on the network. So if I come into your network and I plug it in and I have your community string and I have your MAC address, I just remote into your router. Just like that. It's very simple. In fact, this was 3Com's wonderful man man management system versus Telnet. Okay, another method that they use for management is called TFTP, Trivial File Transfer Protocol. Once again, this is, uh, this is UDP, and it has no authentication. It doesn't even have passwords. Um, if you're lucky, you have, you have to use community strings. TFTP was originally designed to make it so that machines that were booting up on a network would be able to get their configuration off of a server. So they wouldn't have any way of authenticating because they wouldn't even be fully booted up yet. So now, network uh, um, vendors will use this protocol to actually move configs on and off of a router. The the main part of, the, the part that's important of SNMP is what's called MIBs. MIBs stand for Management Information Base. MIBs are the actual data that are on each networking device that provide the information that you can query. Um, the amount that they have MIBs is dependent on the manufacturer and it varies everywhere from, most manufacturers now have just about everything you could possibly think of in the MIB. Um, from the temperature of the box to how many interfaces are on to the serial number that the box is. I mean, everything. Um, you find out the IP addresses, uh, the switch. If you're on a switch, you can see how many ports there are. You can even find out the, um, the text that's of the port, how you've got it defined. So like an ATM switch, you'll have each, a text with each port that defines you know, where this particular OC3 is going. With that, um, when they first started, when they came up with SNMP, they developed this thing called Enterprise MIBs. And what an Enterprise MIB is, is a way for uh, the huge standard for people to, uh, for MIBs. So basically, in a way, you could consider it like DNS in a way. You start at the very root, which is one. 
And it just, you, it actually is a string of like, you know, eight numbers, depending on the manufacturer. But the first six numbers have to do with starting with the root, going through the fact that it's DOD, internet, it's a private network. All those are always the same in every MIB. And then every organization is provided with a number. And this number signifies that organization. So Cisco's number is nine. So I have to read this to you because you can't see it. But the actual beginning of a MIB number for Cisco is 1.3.6.1.4.1, which basically means ISO.org.dod.internet.private.enterprise.9, which signifies Cisco. This is allow basic, you know, standard structure to the whole system. Um, and I have, when I provide the slides, I actually have uh, some FTP sites that provide the entire list of everybody's organization. Now, the standard ends there because on one side, if I have the how many, like say the number for how many interfaces exist on the router is 41, that's not true across manufacturers. But all manufacturers provide documentation on their MIBs. Um, in fact, if you want Cisco's, you go to ftp.cisco.com. They've got like this huge directory with every MIB that they that they have. Now there's. The question is, at this point, is what do you do with SNMP? I mean, how can you use this to get, to do any kind of exploit? So, there's tools that are actually provided for you on most Unix boxes. Um, they're called SNMP get, SNMP set, SNMP walk. Let's start with SNMP walk. What SNMP walk does is you put in SNMP walk, you put in the community string, and you and all it does is it goes and it walks the entire MIB tree. Now, this may not seem like such a big deal, but this will completely take out any router you find on the internet. It will DOS it, no doubt. It actually tries to walk the entire ARP table and routing table. So if this is a router that takes BGP routes, for instance, it's going to try to walk all 60,000 routes, including, like I said, its ARP table, so all its internal network as well, which is more than any router can handle. And so it will actually just take it out. Um, the other ones are actually a little more insidious. SNMP get and SNMP set. These are the tools that you can use to access the MIBs that are available on these particular routers. All right, well, I have this list of really cool MIBs. Trust me on this one. <laughs> and um, what these particular MIBs are, if you can see them, are the, on a, on a Cisco, because you know I just pulled Cisco out randomly, no real reason. Um, there are two particular MIBs that will are your best friend. They go through the whole um, standard part and host config set and write net. What host config set does is you pass it a particular configuration and it will change that configuration on the router, whatever line you want to. What's even better is WriteNet, which basically tells it to do, to pull from your TFTP server a config. So you put yourself a nice little config out on a TFT, TFTP server, send that to a router, it will go to that Unix box and pull the config off. Okay, so let's say you get, you get inside of a router. The question is, most people don't seem to understand what advantages they have by gaining access to the infrastructure. One of the big things you can do inside of infrastructure is you can map the entire network. Those routers have ARP tables, they have routing tables, they know where everything is. Um, if you're in a Cisco environment, it's got what's called CD, um, Cisco Discovery Protocol, which turned on provides every router, every information that's right next to that router. Um, then, for instance, one of the benefits of this is most people don't actually have um, switches that you cannot see the switch. So say you want to get access to a switch to find out what servers are on that. Well, when you trace route through a box, you can't actually see the switch because obviously it's layer two and it just passes over the top of it. When you have access and you do show a CDP on that, you will see the switches as well as the routers. So getting access to the switch at that point is a cakewalk because most people don't put passwords on their switches. It's simply amazing. Um, but they do put it by 
IP addresses, so that's really nice of them to do that. Um, <clears throat> so, the one, of the one of the beautiful things about getting control of the network infrastructure is that the inside of somebody's network is always the soft underbelly. Nobody ever does anything to really say, oh, I got my routers in front of me, I got you know maybe some firewalls, nobody can touch me inside. So there's not much point in putting things like, oh, tough passwords that I'm going to change all the time, any kind of real authentication or anything. I mean, who's going to be able to get access to that? So, I mean, you're in. Um, probably, it's the same kind of thing about when people have an inside job, which they don't really pay much attention to. But you can make changes to routing at this point. Um, you can change. Uh, you can make changes in layer two. You can. One of, the, one of the big things you could do if you were so inclined is layer two, like say ATM, and you've got. You've got a site, um, you've got another site that you're attacking. You can very easily, when you have control, redirect all their traffic to you at a layer two level, which means that you don't even need IP connectivity anymore. You're just pumping data at yourself that you can capture out of the ATM unit. There are things that are coming out, or there have been design specs to do, to try to alleviate this. Um, SMP version 2 has respect. It's never used, and it probably never will be. I, I would be very surprised if it's ever used. Um, it provides authentication. It's more streamlined. It's much more secure, but it has a lot more. It's a little bit tougher to implement, and it's really expensive. I mean, any time when you have to change a big standard like that, it's really expensive. And most people don't seem to realize the importance of things like security. Go figure. Um, so I wouldn't bank on that being really used very much. Oops. I'm gonna screw myself up. Okay, so now you gotta you, you now you're you're the network and, and you really don't want people accessing your router. What can you do to protect yourself? <clears throat> One of the most important things to protect yourself, well, there's several. First of all, don't use private and public as your community strength. <laughs> this is like the biggest mistake that, you know, people laugh and it's funny, but I cannot tell you how many routers I find out there with these as their community strengths. They turn on the routers, they don't even think about the fact that SNMP is set up, and they just like walk away from it. And that is what all manufacturers put standard as their community strengths. So you can pretty much just walk through the internet and find dozens upon dozens of people who have not changed their, their configuration. Um, of course, you know, you could probably find dozens where the password is Cisco. But um, access lists. Now, this is going to leave out most of the ankle biters. As especially with UDP, access lists are not exactly the toughest thing to to um, bypass. But you know you might as well use them because they're there and provided. Sys um, Cisco, for instance, provides two different kinds of access lists. They provide what the standard access list, where you can actually block who is allowed to do SNMP queries, SNMP puts, and who is allowed to do TFTP services. And you can just, you can also who can do telnet and things like and our login and things like that. Might as well put them up. It's got the extended access list on it, so that um, you can you can uh, filter even more tightly than that. Um, what else did I say? Uh, Sorry, it's a slow computer. How much more granularity do the extended access list give you? Extended access list give you the granularity, granularity of using port, um, the the status of the packet, meaning send or ACK, and um, by host or by range of hosts. So, for instance, standard access lists do not give you the option of doing by um, by a network. It can only do by host, but the extended one gives you the access to the host. I mean, to the network. All right. Come on. I think that was, was just. Oh, um, proper logging. Proper logging is really, really important. You really should need. You need to know who's doing changes on your um, routers and who's not. 
and we're talking um, off host logging as well. Not leaving the logging on your host and reading it from your host and hoping that you catch the person as they're doing it. Syslogs provide a tremendous amount of information and they will tell you exactly if people are making configurations to your box or your routers and they will tell you what configuration changes are making. Um, having nice tools that, that go through your syslogs and pull out any possible security violations is a huge help because 99% of the people out there don't, the people who are trying to get in don't really understand syslogs. So. <clears throat> um, what was it? Uh, so you access this. And that's pretty much it for securing. Uh, yeah, so that pretty much covers it. My quick version of this to make sure we can get the experts done. Is there any questions? Sure. Do you have any feedback on like the ISL protocols for or anything like that? Is this the set the ISL? ISL. ISL? Oh, the, the, Cisco, the Cisco bridging stuff? The switch to uh, VLAN bridging over one port, yeah. Oh, oh, well, I mean, uh, it's actually not quite the focus of this, but I know what you're talking about. And um, whenever you're talking VLANs, you have insecurity problems. And when you map so many, trying to map VLANs to different ports like that and adding extra protocols, you're adding insecurities. Um, I don't know of anything in particular with, with ISL, but I wouldn't be surprised if something exists. Especially because there's no authentic authentication of ports, right? So if I'm on a host and I send the correct command to the port, a lot of switches will actually let me change VLANs, which is, you know, another really bad thing. Especially if people are using VLANs to, you know, try to segment their network in such a way. Actually, I almost forgot. That's what I forgot. Segment your network. Um, one of the big problems with this is that it's clear text. So you can put access lists into Sun and Shine, you can put the most incredibly strong community string that exists, but if anybody perchance owns any box on your DMZ, and I'm sure most people have a machine or two that sits outside of their firewall and outside of their normal infrastructure, um, probably on parallel with the routers. They own one of those boxes, they set up a sniffer, they're going to have it. So it's good to segment out your network. I mean, throw away the hubs and put switches in because it's the best thing, that one of the best things there is for security on that, for people, keep people from sniffing. I'm sorry, go ahead. Actually, switches wouldn't provide much protection against sniffing because all you have to do is generate the MAC addresses of the machines that you want to sniff and the yeah. for the thing that there's ways around it, sure, but as a general rule, I mean, you have to know enough about the switch to be able to pull that off, and you have to know what kind of switch they're running to pull that off, because I don't even think that'll work on a Cisco. Be you know what? I'm, I've never tried it. I know it works on 3Com, but, <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, there are ways around it, but it's definitely better than putting a hub up. Um, oh. Uh, can you tell me about send ISDN routers? Is really Say it again. Say that send ISDN routers. Send ISDN routers? ASIN? Oh, oh, send. I'm sorry. Send. Okay. So, you want to know about those? Ascend actually has quite a bit of security problems. A lot has to do with SNMP because they don't really. They actually allow a lot of um, functionality with their SNMP MIBs. And beyond that, I, I know there's problems in the dial up part of it. But, I, do you want to say something about it? I can't, I don't want to lose my job there. Oh. Yeah, I know they have problems. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, they don't have access lists that way, like uh, like a Cisco router does, and I mean they're really they. <laughs> right. Well, which is why most people don't really have that remote configuration in their sense. <laughs> Um, I have a comment. I think I understand the importance of being able to put some PWAP boxes. This gives you conversion information, it gives you times, numerical usage. It's like a gold mine. 
time. Oh, absolutely, but usually when you do it, you're not going to get any information because you're going to take the router down. I learned this the hard way, actually, legitimately, taking my border routers down by SMP locking them. <laughs> well, right, you're right. That's very true. You don't. But that's... Uh, but if, uh, yeah. Right. Oh, that's, yeah, it's this very valuable information for getting more access to the router. You learn what version of code that they're running and, you know, do a search at which out. What bugs in that one? Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's kind of a basic question. Do you want to just let this keep on my router? I can't press it and stuff like that. Don't go to the end. You should say it's not public or private. Is there a way to find out the community strength? Sniffing. Sniffing. Yep. If you if it's on a if it's on a if it's on a shared network, you'll be able to find it that way. Because basically, if what's, what's happening is you can be on a shared network where people are passing data back and forth over the router, which does happen because I've seen people administer um, routers over the internet, and it does exist. <clears throat> Well, was there? I don't. I don't know about those, since I don't really deal with hosts all that much. But also, you mentioned SMP3. Yep. Yep. Yes, and SMP3 is like in the stage of being an ITF standard and not, or it's in draft stage if I remember correctly. Has it? Yes. Yeah. You got a question? Yeah. Yeah, what about running CKC? It's running what? CKC. Cisco Router is more active than some applications. You know, like the firewall feature set. Oh, oh, you know, to be honest, I don't really use those app parts of Cisco because I don't really trust them. Um, <laughs> um, so the, the, I use their access list. I don't use their firewalls. Um, CKC, which you're talking about, I don't really get involved. Small server services, shut them off. Um, pretty much back down to what a Cisco router is supposed to be doing, which is routing traffic. So it's an application proxy. I don't really use it because I use other application proxies, so I've never really played with it. Mm -hmm. Um, just logging everything and you can write the list of projects or branding nature on the you know, you're going to love this. Pearl. <laughs> um, I, I, and I, I have to say, um, I'm a little bit jaded because um, one of the people I work with is a just a scripting god. I've never seen anybody who can do the things he can do with a script. Um, so I've seen pretty much in whole infrastructure is based on scripts that will go through and all the configurations, match it against TACX logs, compare who's actually logging into routers and who's making changes, all possible through standard Perl tools. I, there, there are, I mean, you could, there's, if you go to the Perl sites, they have tons and tons of scripts available. And to be honest, I'm not sure what, like, commercial tools are available to do that kind of thing. I no, I actually haven't found any. I really looked at I mean, I, I've done spanning before, but I've actually never said, hmm, I wonder how I could break this thing. Other than the fact that just by having that available, if somebody gains access to the switch, they can then span the entire port the entire um, switch. Which once again I want to point out, it seems like, you know, oh, of course you're gonna gain access. Getting access of a Cisco switch is trivial because nobody ever puts passwords on these things. Um, it seems to provide an access control list. Uh, can be bypassed. 
Well, yeah. sure. Um, spoofing can do it, especially when you're talking about something like UDP, right? I mean, you you send the UDP packets out, you're not expecting an answer back. So it's I wouldn't say it's trivial to construct a script that would basically build UDP packets on the fly that would make configuration changes with spoofed IP addresses. One thing you can do, one thing it's really important to do in a Cisco router is basically put up an anti-spoofing type <coughs> access list. All it does is says on the outside interface, I don't accept addresses coming from the inside. Very important. Um, one, one thing I want to mention about uh, scan port um, Cisco switches is that currently um, you can only scan the ports that are running in your box. Mm -hmm. If you have a network of switches or several of them are chunked together, you can't see the traffic that's on them. Right. Uh, and that's supposed to be a feature where most scans are going to be in uh, 4 or 5. Oh, that's beautiful. Which kind of points to the importance of making sure that you have the latest and greatest code. And I don't mean the latest like 12. <laughs> I mean the latest code with the bug fixes and the, the security fixes in them to, I mean there's a ton of stuff that's been fixed, but I've seen people run 10.9 Cisco out there and you know, everybody knows of the problems with those. Even, even within certain trees. Are right, it, exactly. If you have a CCO login, you know, read the release. Hence the problem with Cisco source. <laughs> Actually, no, not really, because um, with uh, with any with any of them, you can change the configuration. It's it's not as so much as weaknesses as just it makes actually manageability a little bit easier. But any of them you can use to break in that. If you're using Cisco for an ACL block a majority of the strip chains or whatever, mm -hmm. then I would suggest putting an outbound filter on the external interface so that it actually doesn't even respond and pocket packets are dropped with administrative bullets. Oh. Sends them off to null. Yeah, or um, don't send. Uh, TCP um, refuse, or what is it, um, the, will refuse and the, the, don't send any packets back, what you can do with the Cisco, it'll just let it die. Well, the benefit of TACX and Radius is uh, login authentication. Um, TACX provides a one-time power, you know, theoretically a one-time password and it doesn't really work that effectively but um, it provides a way for that you to have an authentication for when you do logins. It won't do anything for SNMP at all but it'll, allow, it'll stop login type attempts. Radius allows you to have a central database of users and their authentication. Comment. Um, <laughs> make God have mercy. Yeah, UNNT is an operating system for your router. Hmm. Well, you know, the problem is that what <laughs> I, it's funny because there's this one router that I saw out there that's like probably the butt fastest router that exists and it runs NT as its operating system. It's kind of a toned down version of it. It's kind of it's more of an embedded version of it. It's almost an NTCE. But, um, and it's like, <laughs> all right. <laughs> um, but it's the fastest router that I've seen existing. And I'm, I, Berkeley Networks, I believe, is the router name. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's fast because of the hardware, not the operating system. We probably should make that clear. Um, so it's, yeah, I mean, there's many problems in that when you're doing, the benefit of using something like the Cisco in the Bay is they don't really have a real operating system. They're just this loader with some protocols. Okay, one last question. Oh, oh okay. 
Uh, real quick, folks, uh, if anyone knows a Brett Bressler or a Roman Israel, they need to go immediately to the second floor and talk to a lady by the name of Sharon. There is an urgent family emergency. Uh, Mr. Israel is wearing a Amish hat. So if you spot him, please kick him into play and make sure he goes upstairs. Thank you. Oh, and by the way, the, there's a gentleman in the back wearing a yellow hard hat. This gentleman is from Linux World. Is that correct? And would love to talk to anyone who loves Linux. <laughs> or not. What's Linux? And, and sir, running, uh, running into you on a router, may God have mercy on your soul. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> okay, one last quick question. I don't really know a lot about Armand. That's kind of new for me. I would love to tell you more, but I can't. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much for coming. Oh, um, my email address is rooster at resentment.org if anybody has any questions. <laughs> I'd like to. Spot the Fed. Woo! What's that? Yeah, ftp.cisco.com. All right, thank you very much. Yeah.